Well, All right. right! Welcome back to As It Should Be. Paul Bertolino here in the world famous As It Should Be Studios. Unfortunately, not located on 52nd Street, but. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. We have Crystal Durant over here. Hello. We have Tommy Von Voigt over here. Hello. And, uh, well, today we are going to be ranking the Billy Joel albums. Hell yeah. Yeah, right, yeah, because... <sighs> Long Island's favorite song. Long Island's favorite. The Long Island. Yeah, all right. And, uh, yeah, because we knew you weren't quite ready for 2018. I mean, it's... Because we're not. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not really... Don't want myself. it. Don't like it. <laughs> don't want it. <laughs> but, uh, hell, why don't we get right into this? Let's why don't do we it. get right into this? I think... I think... I do. It I begin. You. I start. Who knew? Who knows? Who can remember? Who can keep track of such things? Paul does. Yeah. Okay. All right. So... 12 albums, just the studio albums, no live albums, not even songs in the attic. <laughs> you know, which, you know, I could see where somebody might think that would be on the list, the list but it's yeah. not. Nope. No. Songs in the attic, not on the list. Demos no. in the basement, not on the no. list. Yeah. B sides in the garage, not on no. the list. Attila. Attila. Attila, Attila, not on the should list. Should be on the list. The Hassles records, not on the <laughs> not list. On the Neither list. of them. Yeah. I mean, well, just just assume we, for the the we're not going to be doing a hate segment for this. Just so that's where those are. It's yes. just all good. <laughs> okay. All right. So my list coming in at number twelve. You're going to be shocked. Mm. You're going to be stunned. Will we be appalled? He's probably Paul. not. River of Dreams. <laughs> River of <laughs> Dreams. Ninety three. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, so I so I have notes on these. I'm gonna read. So he's finally out from under the '80s sound that dogged his last few albums, but now he simply doesn't have any songs. It's almost like he forgot how to do what he did. I appreciate that he's trying to do some new stuff, but it's just not working. There's zero fire, as it were, yeah. and uh, I like the cool vocal arrangement on Shades of Grey and almost tagged it as the most interesting track on the record. Then I heard the chorus. Ugh. Okay, so the best tracks on the album, in my opinion, are Lullaby and the closer, famous last words, but eh. Talk about an, un an inessential Billy Joel album. Whew. Mm. And it, it fully explains why he went, oh, I'm not going to make any more contemporary pop records anymore. Yeah. Not if this is what he's going to do. I really can't come at you for this. <clears throat> I can't. I, yeah, I, 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 I know can't. you can't. Yeah. Makes sense. I know you can't. Um, coming in number 11... Stormfront. Mm. Yes. Mm. Quintessential 1989. Just like so many other artists, this is where he tries to backpedal from his... Eight, starts to try to backpedal from his 80s excess, like Kiss with Hot in the Shade, and pretend he has some sort of edge again, while still sounding 80s. We didn't start the fire. I go to extremes. Uh-oh. Your out of touch dad tries to make a Billy Joel album. Oh, that is my way. I, this is the way I sum up this record. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll hear, we'll hear wrong, about though. this. <laughs> wrong. <laughs> Your out of touch dad tries to make a Billy Joel album. Number 10. <laughs> now, yesterday, I, 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 ha I have all the Billy Joel albums up to like physical vinyl copies of them all the way up to Nylon Curtain. But they're pretty much all not here. All I had was this reissue of The Stranger, and I wanted a something to put over here. So I went out to the record stores yesterday to, to you know, grab just like a cheapo Billy Joel album to put in the frame over here. Well, coming in number 10 is the album that I saw by far the most used copies of at every store I went to. Some had like five copies and maybe one of their albums. One album. The Bridge from 1986. Uh. Ooh. <clears throat> okay, I like the verses and bridge on Running on Ice, but I hate the chorus. The chorus of the song sounds the way I would think later Billy Joel that I don't like would sound. Um, this is the time and we, <laughs> with its We Are the World-like chorus, sounds exactly the way I imagine Billy Joel sounds overall to people who can't stand him. Modern Woman was the first single, which I had completely forgotten about. It's one of the cheesiest tracks in his discography. The big single is A Matter of Trust, Trust which I actually don't mind that much. Love I that hated song. the fuck out of that song you like back then. I love that it's song. It's so fucking good. I hated it back then. I I, listening to it freshly now, it doesn't I don't like it. I'm not into it, but like it doesn't bother me. It's it's easily better than the other tracks I've talked about and anything off the albums that are you know, after it. But uh 
Let's see, what do we have here? Baby Grand, the track with Ray Charles is okay. Big Man on Mulberry Street is schmaltzy and just awful. His most overtly 80s album, he sounds spent, he's been chewed up by MTV, the MTV machine, and here's where he gets spit out. But, uh, hmm. Tommy does not agree. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, but hmm. my number nine. Harumph. Harumph, indeed. Harumph. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god. Okay, so my number nine, Cold Spring Harbor from 1971, his first solo album. Prototype Billy Joel. He's obviously finally hit on his thing with this album, but it can be a bit po-faced with the exception of Looks So Good to Me. He sounds like he's trying to be serious and important artiste. Um, his distinct piano style is there immediately with songs like Everybody Loves You Now and Falling of the Rain. Um, I don't much like his voice on this album. He has this rapid Disney princess vibrato that gives him more of a Joan Baez vibe than, say, Elton John. Um, some of the songs are good, but they wouldn't be brought to their full potential until Songs in the Attic. That was number nine? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> hmm. Yes, that's number nine. Number eight, the follow-up, Piano Man, 1973. His first album for Columbia... Obviously, the production is a step up from the first album, but he also sounds way more conf confident, and humor and playfulness start to creep in as well. Naturally, he has a number of great songs on this album, but the quality still isn't consistent like it would be after this. The Ballad of Billy the Kid straight up sounds like Elton John. Uh, there are glimpses of the greatness to come, but only sporadic. Hmm. Number seven... And you, you, should, you should be surprised and happy that this record is this high on the list. An Innocent Man. Mm -hmm. For me, this is, this is a very high ranking for that, this album. At seven? Seven. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I love the concept. On paper, this is right up my alley. But I wish it had been done earlier. By 1983, we're too deep into the decade for it to work for me. A track like Christy Lee, where he's trying to do the little, little Richard thing, just ends up sounding like an 80s TV commercial because of the thin antiseptic over the slip production. Because, I mean, think about how Little Richard records sound. That shit is in the red. Your, 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 your fucking speakers are distorting from Little Richard stuff. This, your, this, this, this track dusts your fucking counters. How are you not catching fire from Tommy's <laughs> eyes right now? If I had he laser vision, you would be dead, dead ten times he's, over he's, this episode. You're failing he's to Cyclops start the fire. all of a sudden from the X-Men. Okay. But that said, that said, <laughs> I like Easy Money, even though I could say all of the exact same things about it. One of the most successful tracks to me in terms of capturing both style and sound is Careless Talk. He does a great job of nailing the Sam Cooke sound. He absolutely 100% nails the Four Seasons sound on Uptown Girl. Problem is, I don't like the Four Seasons. So an 80s remake? What? No, thank you. Wait a minute. What? You don't like the Four Seasons? I don't... I I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I was going to say, remember, we, we, you haven't watched our Singles of the no. Year episodes, have you? <laughs> oh, I got, I got no more homework. No, I remember you don't like that. Yeah. We've had that talk. Um... Number six. Street Lab Serenader. Uh huh. <laughs> His third album, <laughs> 1974. <laughs> this is where things start to get good, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, with, this al with this album, he truly found his voice, not only as a writer, but as a vocalist. Even though he's backed by session musicians and wouldn't start recording with his live band until the next album, this sounds like he's in the studio with a band rather than just tracks being built around a, a singer songwriter. With songs like Los Angelinos and Weekend Song, he starts to take it to the next level with more aggressive vibes that, that mix in to give uh, the album more variety. Yeah, I have always really liked that one. And uh, coming number five, Turnstiles. Yeah, 1976. He's on the eve of his breakthrough on this album. Now, Billy Joel, he's back in New York City, and this is where things really start to get good. By far his best collection of songs up to this point, which uh, falls just short of touching the nerve that this, his next few albums do because it's self-produced. I think had Phil Ramone produced this album, it would have been his breakthrough. Yes. Yeah, you know what I mean? Come on, say goodbye to Hollywood, Good. Summer Highland Falls, New York State of Mind, for fuck's sake, James, Angry Young Man, I've Loved All These Days. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Number four, some, some people are going to say I have this one too low, but I don't. 
Fifty Second Street, nineteen seventy eight. I toyed with putting turnstiles above this one because I don't like side two on this even half as much as side one. Side one is consistently on the level of the stranger, but side two just doesn't stack up, uh, except uh, up and except until the night, which is epic. But in the end, side one alone pulls this album up to number four. So, number three. The Nylon Curtain from 1982. Mm-hmm. One of his most mm-hmm. underrated albums, in my opinion. And from what I've read, it's Billy Joel's own favorite. Yeah. It has Crystal's favorite song, ah! Allentown. <laughs> I hated Allentown in the 80s, but I love it now. Sometime in, around in my 30s, it just everything changed for me on that. I started to love it. They started closing all the later. factories down. Shut yeah, up! Yeah, exactly. And it's just Crystal, like, have you heard the union people crawled away? I <laughs> Once we started living the song, you. I just couldn't resist it anymore. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but Laura, total 1967 Lennon. Yeah. Pressure. I thought this was some edgy new wave when I was 12. It was like... <laughs> <laughs> Good night, Saigon. Fucking incredible song. Yeah. She's right on time. Great chord, chord changes and melodies, surprises, Scandinavian skies, more 67 Lennon. Yeah, great record. And number two, the record that somebody in the uh, comments said, better be somebody's number one. Oh, yeah. Well, it's not mine. <laughs> Glass Houses from 1980. Uh. Some pseudo new wave vibes start creeping in on this one. You may be right. And, uh, you know, sometimes a fantasy and all that kind of stuff. Now, You May Be Right is a great track, but it's a bit frustrating because it's dying to rock harder. Phil Ramon kind of neutered this one. There, there desperately needs to be some harder, more present guitars on this, but I still love the fuck out of that track. Uh, sometimes a fantasy, Don't Ask Me Why, one of my very favorite Billy Joel songs. That song. It's still rock and roll to me. Loved that at the time. When I, I was 10, when this was new, that, that was. If I had done a, a singles ranking, for 1980, in 1980, this would probably be like my top three for that year. Damn. Uh, all for Lena, one of his best deep cuts. Love that. It's a great Fucking song. great record. Um, but my number one. Yeah, of course. Who's next? No, I. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite. The Stranger. Yeah, I mean, I, come I, you on, know, son. I, you know, come on. No matter what. Yeah. I mean, now, what what, do you, what what can you even say about this album that doesn't say for itself? Yeah, yeah. My, so my notes say, The Stranger. All right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Does it really? Does it? No. Oh, okay. No, okay, all I did okay, is okay. list the song. Well, okay, look. For, for the uninitiated, let me list the tracks for you here. Moving Out, The Stranger, Just the Way You Are, Scenes from an Italian Restaurant, Vienna, Only the Good Die Young, She's Always a Woman, Get It Right the First Time, that's short of just the one final song. Tell us in the comments which of those songs you haven't heard on the radio. Yeah, really. We're still waiting. Yeah. yeah. The last song is Everybody Has a Dream. That's the only song you're not going to know going in. And honestly, I think it's a little bit of a weak track. But the, but the rest of the album is just so fucking undeniable that I don't care if the last song was We Didn't Start the Fire. I would still put this at number one. You know? Yeah, you have to be a certain age to know the whole thing. Yeah. Well, like, yeah. I feel, you know, you got to be at least... 50, maybe, to know the, the whole thing? I well, don't think oh, it, I don't Tom, know. Tom, 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 that's a list. That's a list. You you know what? I cannot deny this. It's a list. Mm. Ah, it's a list. Tom, Tommy's clapping, you know. <laughs> with trepidation? Yeah, yeah with, with much well, trepidation. Well, you know what? I, I, I suspect that uh, some of my comments are more uh, gnawing at you than my placements. <laughs> yes, there's, there's going to be some rebuttals to your placements. Let's just, well, we'll get there. He'll, yeah, he'll have something to say. Yeah. As will I. Yes, you will. I will. Yes, you okay. shall. I shall. All right, then. All well, right. let's see. Uh, are there any Billy Joel commercials? He, I, I, don't, I don't know yet. Oh, we'll find, find out. out. Let's find out. You'll know before we do. <laughs> Every week, a thousand new passengers Finding trains the best way Going to work or enjoying the work So why don't you try us today? Cause the more you use us The better we get Buses and ferries and trains The more you use us The better we get Buses and ferries and trains With lots of new carriages There's even more coming A fresh painted 
And Tommy, <laughs> are you ready? Are you ready to tell us all about Billy Joel albums? Let me uh, just have a little bit of ginger ale here. Mm-mm-mm. Today's episode is brought to you by Bodega Ginger Ale. Schweppes. Bodega Ginger Ale, everybody. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I come at this from a, uh, a bit of a unique point of view from the two from both of yours as as you know and as some people some of our viewers know I was born and raised on Long Island Long Island out in Suffolk County on the south shore of Long Island yeah the Billy, Mecca yep the Billy Mecca. Joel famously once said uh, growing up on Long Island you can either date a rich girl from the North Shore, shore or a cool girl from the South Shore. Ah. <laughs> um, and Billy Joel's the Elvis of Long Island. Long Island. Island. <laughs> That's yeah. um, really good analogy. And, and the Frank Sinatra. And the Frank Sinatra, and Frank Sinatra of Long Island, yeah. <laughs> I definitely experienced something. Um, there's a phenomenon with Billy Joel where, and this isn't universally true for everyone that's it's from Long Island, but people that live there, if they then move away for any period of time, they will suddenly realize how much they deeply love Billy Joel's music and hadn't really recognized it while they were living there and surrounded right. by it, and it was just such a, a heavy part of your lives. And then when you're away, you're like, oh, yeah. he speaks to me. And I definitely went through that. I experienced that. And living down in Florida for 16 and a half years, um, I just my love for his music just grew exponentially, being away from home. Makes sense. Right. And, you don't um, realize it when you're soaking in it. You don't. You really yeah. don't. Yeah. But yeah. it's it's just it to a degree. Billy Joel's music is you know part of my part of my makeup in a way. You know, it's just it's a part of the fabric of Tommy. Yeah. So with that being said, we're going to kick things off with my number twelve, and that will be Street Life Serenade. <laughs> I'm like I, I heard the S, and I'm like, wait, the stranger? What? <laughs> Jesus Christ, I'm not insane. What? I wasn't dropped on my head in Long Island. Mm. Well, so, yeah, Street Life wow, Serenade. Really? So, so, you know, I should probably clarify how I'm ranking these albums. And it, it is when, when, you, when you're dealing with Billy Joel records, well, sure, there are some that we're going to get to later in the list where either almost every damn song on it is just, so is just incredible. Wait, hold, is this going to be a treatise? No, it's not even a treatise. Oh, okay. Not even a treatise. Right, just it's a just a... It's just a, it's just a you know Clarif just a brief explanation. Okay. It's not a crystal clarification. Okay. It's, a, it's a Tommy clarification. It's a Tommy, Tommy clarification. clarification. Okay. Yeah. So with the Billy Joel record, you know, obviously when we get deeper into our list, there's albums that almost every damn song on it is an absolute banger. It's practically a greatest hits album. We've sometimes described great albums as this might as well be a greatest hits record. And he's got somewhere like, you know, the entire first half is like, God damn. And then a lot of his other stuff in his catalog is like, you basically look through it and you got, you got your filler tracks and you got the absolute standout, holy shit, I cannot believe how good this song is. <clears throat> and pretty much every album he's got is like that, including yeah. Street Life Serenade. And for me, that song would be The Entertainer on mm, this album. Which is, yeah. okay. But I find that to me, and all this shit is just opinion, and my opinion is not worth a hill of beans if you disagree, but for me, the rest of Street Life Serenade sounds like very much B and C side material and filler tracks to me. Okay. But that one song stands head and shoulders above the rest, and it is a fantastic, fantastic song in this catalog. But the rest of the album does just doesn't hold up. Ahead of that, at number 11, no surprise, River of Dreams. Now, you, of course, knew that that was going to be very low ranking. You have it ranked dead last. Um, I rank it second, second to, dead to dead last, last. but second it is still very, very, very low ranking on my list. It's just, 
You know, I think you put it well. I think he is just really very much noticeably creatively spent at this point. Yeah. And um, he has said, because people have been hounding him for decades, why'd you stop making music? Why'd you stop? Why'd you stop? And when you have a body of work like Billy Joel's, of course you're going to get people asking you that question. Why don't you make us more of a great music? Right. And he has said that he finds the process of writing songs so exhausting and so unenjoyable, he just doesn't want to do it. He and sounds like he feels that way on that he, album. Yes, and I would have to agree. Yeah. He, I would have to agree. He really... It seems like he's trying to explore some new things on here. They're not really working. It's just... There's not, he doesn't really have a strong jumping off point for any of these ideas. It's just very weak. And number 10, Cold Spring Harbor. Now, Cold Spring Harbor is not a great album. It's got a few bright spots. Paul, you put it great as it's Proto Joel. It's Proto Joel. It's yeah. Proto Joel. You can definitely hear all the ingredients are there. He just hasn't quite figured out how to put them together and bake the He can't bake execute it quite yeah. at his top level yet. Yeah, he's not quite there. And I, I know that he was very dismissive of, the, of this album, not only in later years, but almost immediately because of the issue with mastering, yeah. where, as some of you might or might not know... Chipmunk punk! Yeah, the pressing plant <laughs> accidentally or on purpose. Who the fuck even knows? It's lost the time. They uh, sped up the tapes when they mastered it for vinyl, and when he heard it, he sounded like a chipmunk. And he was like, ah, fuck this record! It's been fixed in later pressings, obviously. You've probably never even heard 30 the years later, they fixed it. It, it, it like, took that long? It took that long. It was a long time. Well, so when it initially went on on to CD, probably in the mid-80s then, it was just still that shitty... See, I assumed that, that they had it. fixed it even then. I, yeah, I don't know. Because I, I don't personally remember actually ever hearing the chipmunkified version of this. I did. But then um, again, well, in fairness, though, he did go back and he corrected some of this on Songs in the Attic, yeah. and I might have been more exposed to this, the Songs in the Attic versions mm. yeah. and stuff. Um, but it's neither here nor there. He was never that satisfied with it, and I don't think it's just because of the mastering issue. I think maybe he also possibly recognized that he could maybe do better, and clearly he ended yeah. up doing better. Not so great. He was still improving. He <laughs> yes. Was improving. Yeah. Yes. I mean, this is... I'll tell you this, though. Considering the previous year was the Attila album, yeah. and we go from Attila yeah. to, to this... Yeah. yeah. Night and day. So number nine... You would maybe have thought this would have ranked higher. It is, it is an aggressively 80s album from him. 1986's The Bridge, coming in at only number nine. Oh. The reason and why... Those five copies I saw at the store used were, was his copy. Now, as, as I have mentioned before, <laughs> um, I am not some superficial idiot where you can trick me with some glossy 80s production. Gated reverb alone is not enough to make me like your track if the track is fucking weak. You gotta have a song. I love 80s production, it's my favorite production, but if it's not good music that you're doing that to, I am not going to like it. And that whole decade is littered with examples of music where everyone was doing that because it was the latest production trend. But if you're not bringing songs to the party, not good. I'm not going to attend. Now, there are a couple of bright spots on this one. And for me, the one that stands head and shoulders above the rest on this one is, of course, Matter of Trust. Love that song. I cannot get enough of Matter of Trust. It's so great. It's incredible. I love everything about that song. It's great. My number eight, 52nd Street. Mm. Wow. Only number eight. Wow. wow. Only number eight. Wow. A few, a few very, very strong moments, but a lot of stuff I just don't care for. You know, he went through a period around this time with this one and Glass Houses where he very much front-loaded his albums. Like... Glaringly, oh, aggressively front so. Album. Aggressively so. Yeah. This one in Glass Houses, it's like, whoa! Yeah. Is this whole thing gonna be? Like, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I guess I'm gonna use the bathroom. You guys leave this yeah. plane. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, I don't know. That's. I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to sound so disrespectful because it's not like the music on side two is necessarily bad. It just doesn't do anything. For it's just me. comparatively. Comparatively. You know. I, and I remember actually we had done a. Um, when we did the Billy Joel F-bomb, and I think it was Drew that did all of 52nd Street as a set. 
Yes. Oh, yeah. And I believe, or maybe that was some other show he did it, or something. It Drew was that, that one. Yeah. It was that one. He did all of 52nd Street as a set. And, you know, sometimes when you are presented with music that had never really done anything for you, and it's presented in a different setting, either be it in a live setting, or perhaps in being used in a movie, and you're, it's just, you're just able to reappreciate it, or appreciate it in a new light. And here I heard the entirety of 52nd Street live by a band that was killing it, and the second half of this album still didn't do a goddamn thing for me. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Mm. My number seven, Piano Man. Yeah. Piano Man all the way at number seven. Mm. Now, Piano Man, the weak stuff on this album, I think, is potentially approaching as weak as the weak stuff on Cold Spring Harbor. Yeah, there's still I, a I lot of yeah. Definitely agree. There's still a lot of elements on this on Piano Man where it's still there's still a proto Joel vibe going on, but there are a couple of tracks on here that stand out to such a degree. Obviously, the title track. Obviously, Captain Jack. You're my home. <clears throat> I don't know if you guys are overly familiar overly familiar with You're My Home. That song stops me dead in my tracks every time I hear it. There's just something so magical and touching and sweet. Perhaps even bittersweet about that track, and uh, those three tracks alone elevated this up to Ooh, number seven. Record. It really did. Slightly ahead of that, but not by leaps and bounds. Number six, we've got the Nylon Curtain. I understand it's Billy's favorite album. He's wrong. <laughs> he, moving <Billy's> on. Wrong. <laughs> Ooh, Billy, you're wrong. Moving on. <laughs> what do you know, Billy? What do you know? You just wrote it. You've all been wondering, as have both of you, where this next album was going to land on my list. And here we have coming at number five, Stormfront. Mm. Oh. <laughs> Stormfront, for me, is one of the most Long Islandy Long Island albums. Super Long Island. It's, so, it's Long it. Island as fuck. Oh, Way man. too long. <laughs> I'm, I, I am there for, I am going to get on the Down Easter Alexa. Oh. And that song is so good, right? I love that Jimmy's, song. Yes, right? It's good. There ain't no island left for I islanders like me. Oh. oh my god, that song just hit me in all the feels when I was a kid. I like it. And I didn't even know any Long Island fishermen. I'm like, what the plight of the Long Island fishermen? It's terrible. I don't even like seafood or boats. <laughs> and he won me over. Anyway. That's good song. <laughs> power of Billy. <laughs> the power the of power Billy, Billy compelled me. Yeah, yeah. it did. Um, <laughs> and also, I love We Didn't Start the Fire. I don't care. I know it is a deeply polarizing song. It, I love it. I'll talk. Uh, I love it. It is so of its time. And guess what? I love that time. Yeah, I was going to say, of its time. <laughs> of its time. Oh, shit. Oh, my appreciation shit. of it just went, went even lower. lower. <laughs> if, you don't, if you don't stand for 1989... You're not going to fuck with We Didn't Start the Fire. Mm. But no. I am there for 1989, and I'm not talking about Taylor. No. I mean, let's be real. Even people who stand for 1989, a lot of them don't stand for We Didn't Start the Fire. That is true. You know, I recently did, um, I, I sang that one in one of those Jesse Krakow Fever Dream shows. Oh, oh <laughs> yeah. really? Yes, yes. Nice. And, and did you actually remember every fucking lyric, or did you have to I, I had the entirety of the original lyrics remembered. This is Tommy Von Committed Boy, to memory. the man who did the whole fucking Vincent, uh, Vince, Vincent Price the monologue, monologue before your oh, uh, well, Alice I mean, Cooper for show. Black what Widow. The fuck? I also had the entirety of It Takes Two by Rob Deep, Rob Bass and Daisy yeah, Rock. Yeah, memory. Tommy's so brain. yes, I had I had the entirety. We didn't start the fire memorized, and then, then, I wrote additional verses, bringing us all the way up to the present day. What? I extended oh the song God. by a couple of minutes See? and brought us through the nineties. The aughts, the teens, all the way up to now. Now, see, that's yes. Jesse Krakow fever. And I gotta theme. tell you, I'll tell you what, I put the freaking work in, and those new verses are fire. And then I found out <laughs> while I was doing it that apparently Fallout Boy had released a cover of it where they changed all the words. Really? And I specifically did not listen to it while I was writing my own versions because I was like, I don't want to hear what their take on it was. Hmm. So I did my version, I did the little show, and we, there's footage of it. And um, and then like the next day, I listened to the Fall Out Boy version. I'm sorry, I can objectively say I don't care what you think. If you think this is arrogant, my new lyrics spank the hell out of Fall Out Boy's lyrics. Of course. Well, I'm I will say this: I've that. only heard the Fall Out Boy one, and uh, 
the cat out in the hall could do better lyrics. Yeah. So I mean, you know, no, I, so I'm, I'll, I'll buy that. Not having heard Tommy's, I'll I'm buy that. I'm not surprised by that at all. Yeah. Well, I, I do. I write songs. I write lyrics, and also I deeply like this song. So when you actually come to a project and you give a shit, it you does make it better. It. Yeah. yeah. I, I have no idea if Fall Out Boy was being serious, but I, it seems to me like they did it as a goof because they phoned it in, and they also did not do everything in chronological order. See, that's the thing. Billy's version, all his lyrics are in chronological in order. order from yeah. the late 40s all the way up to yeah. the late 80s. 80s yeah. So what I did is I continued in chronological order. I didn't just go for cheat, easy rhymes and put things wherever they would fit. I went in sequence, and we if I couldn't make me. it work... So how many verses was that? I I, think, how many added verses? I think I did like three or four additional verses. So it became wow. a Bob Dylan song. I'm pretty much. It was like eight minutes long I think when I was done okay. with it nice I want to see this um, video I'll have, to, I'll have to send it to you guys yeah. <laughs> yeah so my number four Turnstiles mm. yeah mm -hmm. Turnstiles Bucky, great and underrated Billy Joel very yeah, underrated yeah. and there's a song on there that I love that you actually didn't even mention when you were rattling off all the killer tracks on there Miami because it isn't any good Miami 2017 so oh lights you go know down what no, that is, good. That is yeah. a good one yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, there was a point where I, um, when I, uh, I was listening to that, and and I was like, oh shit, he's talking about all people that move away from New York and move down to Florida. You know, at one <laughs> Tommy point, Tommy wouldn't know anything about that. At one point, that. he was talking. To, it's like there's a sly reference to that. Mm. Okay, my number three. Sorry, glass houses. Number three. So that's two people in a row that did not have glass houses at their number one slot. Mm. Glass Counting on you, Crystal, to, to complete the trifecta of rebelliousness. Over, yeah, we all individually and mutually do what we want. Yeah. And what we want so far <laughs> is to not put glass houses at number one. But but dangerously close. Dangerously close. Super I mean, close. glass when 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 I have an album listed at number three, that is a seriously for real album. Yeah. I mean, yeah. come on. Yeah. Well, especially with records like this. I mean, Seriously. Yeah. I'm not disrespecting Glass Houses. No. Glass Houses is fantastic. And another example of Front Loaded, but my God, that that A side. Yeah. I mean... There's insane. some good stuff on side too, yeah. but... but good yeah. Lord. Yeah. Could you imagine if you took the A side of Glass Houses and the A side of 52nd Street and that was an album? Ooh. Woo! I'd still put The Stranger over it, I, but... But it would be some stiff competition, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that would be tough. Yeah. That would be yeah. real tough. T-U-F-F. But ahead of that, we've got number two with An Innocent Man. Uh, yeah. I love the concept, and for me, he nailed it. And he nailed it with the production. Screw you, Bertolino. <laughs> <laughs> Screw you, Bertolino, and the grumpy fucking curmudgeonly horse you rode in on. Uh, and, I mean, come on. Come on. This is the album's got Uptown Girl. Yeah. Uptown Girl. Holy shit. You don't even understand how much I love that song. I know people are sick of it, but it's still a great song. Like, well, as long I as am you sick of them. As long as you don't listen to it. Yeah, as long you as you don't listen to it. 800, <laughs> 800 times in a row. Bad Paul. Bad. 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 Paul. <laughs> um, Damn. Yeah, love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. I uh, We did that one in a show, and I, unfortunately, I've never really quite had the range to sustainably sing the entirety of Uptown Girls' lead vocals, um, no matter how hard I tried. So we had Craig Mann sing lead, and I was just happy to be a part of the background oh, vocals, nice. which was me, yeah. Paul, and Reginald. <laughs> Original, yeah. yeah. It was the three and that of was actually really great. I mean, whatever my feelings are about that song, I had all kinds of fun singing that song. And we killed it. We and we you did a good job. Crushed yeah. that shit. Can we post the link and, to and that? This, sure. Yeah, but I think yeah, yeah, I think it's probably online. Yeah, it's if, really, we, if we really can find great. it, we'll post that below. Really and great. you cannot wipe the smile off my face while we're doing <laughs> that. Yeah, it was awesome. But moving on to my number one. I mean, come on. Hmm. What could it possibly be? I don't Who's know. next? It's absolutely, Who's it's next? absolutely Led Zeppelin IV. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's Led it's the stranger. I mean, God, could you imagine what it must feel like as an artist to have made an album like that? Well, you know, there there are two sides to it. There's one, yeah, to achieve some to achieve something on that level that's that all time and has that much of an impact on music and on culture. But at the same time, a writer like Billy Joel, I could imagine where he's kind of like, okay, got it, people, the fucking stranger. I have other stuff, too. Yeah. I wish I could do something else that would make you feel like that also. You know, there's got to be that, too. I, yeah, there probably is a level of frustration about it, too. Uh, I just hope that he is able to, at some points in time, 
just enjoy, just deeply enjoy the satisfaction of knowing. Yeah. That he wrote The Stranger. Yeah. Which depends on where you're standing. If he hadn't made a record like that, he would wish that he would... That he would have made that, that album, you know? I know. If he, if know. he was uh, us, he would be like, fuck, man, could you imagine making a record like that? Well, yeah. yeah. I remember reading an interview with Slash from Guns N' Roses, and he was talking about Appetite and the, leg the, the legacy of Appetite. Now, it's a legendary album. And he says when he was growing up and getting into rock and roll and first got his mind blown by Aerosmith Rocks and everything like that, and how there, you know, some bands are just fortunate enough to have that one record that is just like, whoa, whoa. Yeah. This is like, this is like, a, a, it's culturally significant, um, like legitimately important. And he feels as though for them it was appetite destruction that they were, they were for destruction they were fortunate enough to have that. Yeah. And he says he feels there are times when he just feels incredibly honored that he has that even he if he's never done anything else. Yeah, he's got his back in black. He's got his Aerosmith rocks. He's got his The Stranger, yeah. and that's an artist that I think is able to objectively recognize. Well, we we actually have one of those though. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. for all our artistic frustrations, we have more to show, and we have other music. But they also he knows. But we've got that. Yeah. Well, I feel like somebody like Slash, there's a bit more, more fan in him. Per perhaps, yes. Than somebody like Billy Joel. Billy Joel's a fan, but I think Slash is like regular guy fan. Like he just still you know? just loves rock. And yeah, rock, you yeah. Know? Yeah. So, but so anyway, he can, he can yeah. look at it from where we stand. I think maybe he can. Yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. Billy but, Joel's just kind of on that other level. So. And he has been for quite some time. Yeah. So that's that's my list from right. uh, Mr. Suffolk County over here. <laughs> Mr. Suffolk County. All right. All right. That's good. My mascara has to lengthen and thicken, separate and define, and make my eyes leap off the page. It has to last without smudging. It has to have a fiber-free formula with a brush that's curved to color every lash. It has to make my eyes look big and beautiful. CoverGirl's demanded it. All you do is ask for it. CoverGirl Professional Mascara. All right. Okay. Well, uh, we're back. We are the clean up a woman. We are shiny. Is gonna give us a list. Oh well. Bill Joe, she does love. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna put me with Betty Wright. I'll take it. Well, you know, you you come in last, so you're the clean up. Oh, you know, you're, you're, you're gonna yeah, clean it all up. Clean up. Yes. All right. So, um, yeah. So I, for some reason, I added Street Lights, ser Street Life Serenade. Can that is. That's that's a. That's I know. Um, meh. Meh. That's what I have to say about that. Maybe. Oh, you hadn't had that one on your list That's originally? My 13. No, no, no. I have it. I was just wait, wait. How do you have 13? You should have 12. 12. Well. Ooh, no, this is exciting. Did I miss number Ooh. something? Okay. Let's see. Oh, shit. She has Grace's volume two in she there. Get, does she? No, I'm kidding. Oh, okay. I, 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 I can't see her. Right. It's curious. I'm going to be curious to see which Three, mysterious. Two, one. 13th yeah. Billy Joel album she has on this list. I think I have everything. All right. All, all right. right. Let's, so, let's, let's, let's get find into it. Out. Let's, let's find get out. into it. All right. So I have number 12, I have Piano Man. Yeah. Um, I like Captain Jack. It's, I love that song. And obviously I'm sick of Piano Man, like a lot of other people are tired as of As great of a song it. as it is. As great a song as it is. If, if I don't... If it's once a year, I'm good. You know, I try not to sing along, but... I grew up in a time where that song was in every bar jukebox... And along with Brown Eyed Girl, that song was played to <laughs> death by drunken people. Yeah. So I got really sick of it. Um, so Philadelphia, shout out to Philadelphia. Uh, there's an edition of this record that um, has a live 1972 broadcast from 93.3 WMMR from Philadelphia. Um, capturing an earlier performance by him recorded at Sigma Sound. Everybody should know Sigma Sound. And... Um, this was in instrumental in catalyzing his musical career, apparently. Following the recording of the show, the live rendition of Captain Jack became a staple on the station, and I do remember this because they played it all the fucking time, ultimately becoming the most requested song in WMMR's history, which I'm having a hard time believing. Maybe up to that point up to it that was point. the most Could requested, point, but definitely yeah. not afterwards. Not since. Um, 
Yeah, so that is the thing that got uh, Columbia Records interested in him, and they offered him a recording contract after that was on WMMR all the time. Legend has it. Um, and also, long, long time, Josephine and Rosalinda were on there, too. Uh, at number 11, I have Cold Spring Harbor. came out in 1971. Is this the one with the horrible picture thing of him with the mustache? And he's yeah, just black like, and white. High, high contrast. High black contrast, yeah. white and white. I hate that. It looks ugly. It's not a good photo. It's not a good picture. I'm so glad you shaved your face, Billy, because the mustache was not working. Uh, he looks like he looks like those early, those early like 71, 72 photos you see of Paul Stanley and Gene Simmons. Yeah, when yeah, they have yeah mustaches. he does. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, not good. Uh, yeah, that was the one where the master was fucked up. And in 1983, producer Artie Rip oversaw a remixed, edited, and speed corrected version of the album. The revised edition was issued by Columbia Records. In, in what year? 83? 1983. Okay. Hmm. That's, that's what I read. Uh, number 10, I have Fantasies and Delusions. Oh, you put his classical album in your list. Yeah. Oh, that's what fucked it that's up. That's what oh, messed it up. Oh, okay. Now it makes and sense. I, <laughs> but it came in above... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, man. Now, this... And I, I don't think most people know about this. That's the reason why I put it in here, because I'm a big classical music fan, as we know. So this is the only studio album containing classical compositions. It features his longtime friend, the British-Korean pianist Richard Hyung Ki Ju, performing compositions written by Billy Joel. It was his 19th album to chart on the Billboard 200, reaching number 83 in October of 2001. The album debuted at number one on Billboard's top classical albums chart. How about that? How many pop artists do you know who have something on the Number one on a classical chart? I think that's a feather in his cap. Yeah, that's great. I want more Uptown Girl. Oh, God. All right. So then at number nine, I have River of Dreams. <laughs> I like that song. You like that song? I do. River of Dreams. Coming in at number eight, Whoa. I have The Bridge. It came out in 1986. A Matter of Trust. I love that song. I. Yep. It. Yep. Uh, uh, bleh. Bleh. Mm -hmm. It's great. Um, in a retrospective interview, Joel said, Not a happy album. I wasn't simpatico with the musicians, some of whom I'd been working with a long time. I don't think the material was good. I was pressured by management to put it out too fast. By the end, I sort of gave up caring, which for me was unusual. I remember reading bad reviews and agreeing with them. Damn. So there you go. That's uh, humble. Uh, but later, he admitted to Rolling Stone that at the time of the album's writing and recording, he was in no mood to be in the studio either, saying, Christine and I had, or Christy and I had just had Alexa, and I'd have much rather been at home with the baby. The angst over leaving his wife and daughter at home was poured into the album track, Temptation. Mm. Mm. Which makes sense when you listen to it. I did not know that. Coming in at number seven, I have Turnstiles. It came out in 1976. Say oh, goodbye you had that to in the wrong spot. I do what? Yeah, it should be higher. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Number seven, I have Turnstiles. <laughs> came out in 1976. <laughs> Say Goodbye to Hollywood is one of my all time favorite songs ever. That's a good I song. love that song. The Castanets alone. Like, come on. Yep. Oh, so good. So good. New York State of Mind, of course. All You Want to Do is Dance. Uh, and the album cover photo was shot at the uptown platform of the subway at Astor Place. According to Joel, each of the characters on the album cover was meant to represent a particular song, e.g. the girl in headphones for All I Want to Do Is Dance, the wealthy couple for I Love These Days, etc., etc., etc. Coming in at number six, I have Stormfront. Came out in 1989. The Down Easter Alexa. I know. I love that song. Yeah. It's really, really good. It really is. I, it's... It's yep. bad. It's like... It's one of the best sea shanties. Yeah, kind of is, yeah. It's really great. <laughs> when you think about it, it's totally a sea shanty. But great. Uh, you know, yeah. Um, I Go to Extremes. I love that song. Yep. I Go to Extremes. I love it. Stormfront. I love that song. It's very funky. This, you know? This fucking guy over here. Look at this. Uh, he, can, <laughs> he can muppet it all he wants. And we didn't start the fire. Oh. Yeah, you know, you get sick of hearing it, but it is a really good song. And I'm excited to hear your version, Tommy. Yes. Coming in at number five, The Nylon Curtain came out in 1982. 
Yes, it contains the song that's the bane of my existence, <laughs> Allentown, which should have been Bethlehem, because that's really... Shut up, Tommy! Because that's really what he was singing about. It was Bethlehem. God damn it, Tommy. Stop it, Tommy. Stop it! And, uh, and Pressure, which is the song that... Shut up, Paul! Oh my god! Wait, you don't like pressure? So hot in here. Bum, 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 bum. No, I do like pressure. That was the, that was a song that I sang at that f bomb. Oh right, yeah, you did. Sing I, that I song. did, and I I wasn't thrilled about it for some reason when I did it, but I was mad about something at the time. So I was in eleventh grade. Ronald Reagan was president. And that gives you a little clue as to what was going on then. Mm. Coming in at number four, an innocent man came out in nineteen eighty three. Hits, 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 hits. Tell her about it. I love it. It's a throwback with the horns and everything. Mm-hmm. It's great. Uptown Girl. I love that song. Yes! It's so, good. It's so yes! good. His homage to that time period. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, the uh, Keeping the Faith. I love it. <sighs> and The Longest Time. Whoa. Uh, do do up. Do up brilliance. Mm-hmm. You know, Tommy's on board for that. Oh, yes. I am right there. Um, all the pop music from the 50s, late 50s, early 60s, R&B, The Four Seasons, which Paul loves, Motown, and soul music. That's a great record. I love that record. Coming in at number three, I have 52nd Street. Now, <laughs> yeah. My Life. Another song that people are, a lot of people are probably sick of hearing. And especially because it was on TV. Uh, what show was that up on? Um, it was became the, the theme uh, to... Bosom uh, Buddies. Bosom Buddies, yeah, yeah, yeah. The second <laughs> in of Bosom Buddies. At, which is like, what? Yeah. It's stupid, but yeah. Um, and Big Shot, I love Big Shot. You had to be a big shot. Big shot. Did yeah. you? <laughs> I really loved that song in I 1978 when I was a kid. I love that song. It's so great. Yeah. Honesty. I love that song. Yeah. <laughs> Did you ever hear the uh, origin story of that song? For Honesty? Honesty. Yeah. I think I have. Wait, he he just had the melody and the and the music. He didn't have any actual final words yet, including for the big hook. So he would they would be he would be going over it with the band and his drummer. Um, what's his name? Uh, Liberty Devito, Devito yeah. would sometimes just substitute shit and sing instead. And they were going over honesty, and it wasn't yet honesty. And Liberty DeVito is just back there going, "Oh, son of me!" And at that point, he was like, "Okay, this song cannot be sodomy. I need to actually finish That's the damn the words." <laughs> and he turned it into honesty. honesty. Yeah. Sodomy, <laughs> such a horny <laughs> word. word. Yep, that's, everything. That's is what was going on. Oh, yeah, that's the drummer was doing that. Right yeah. there, you. <laughs> I love it, and I also love Rosalinda's eyes. That's that's a great yeah. song too. Coming in at number two is Glass Houses. Oh no! Sorry, dude. Oh shit! Because originally I wanted to make a tie between the number two and number one, but I really thought about the time when I was listening to these records. And as much as I love Glass Houses, Aaron McGinley, you know how often we played Glass Houses while hanging out at your house, all of the time. Every weekend, I was at her house, she was at my house. We wore out that record, especially that first side. I mean, fuck. Still rock and roll to me. You may be right. <sighs> ah! All yeah. for Lena, Don't Ask Me Why. I love Don't Ask Me Why. Yeah. A little Calypso kind of thing going on. Sometimes a fantasy. Oh, 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 I oh, love oh, oh. that song. I love that song. And even the French song. Uh, Ciata, um Toy, You Were the One. I love that one, too. It's a great, it's a great record. It's almost the greatest hits record, like they said already. But well, jeez, that that leaves us. That leaves to the wait a minute. Who, what could she possibly? What have could at I possibly one? have at number it's one? It's gonna be. It's gonna be Abbey Road. <laughs> <laughs> Coming in at number one, Dark Side of the Moon oh! <laughs> by Pink Floyd. Yeah. No. Well, in a, in a way, yes. In a way, yes. Obviously, yeah. it's the Stranger. Yeah. Come yeah. on, yeah. moving out. Anthony's song. She's always a woman. Ah. Oh, no. oh man! Just the way you are. Yeah, you're sick of it, but it's great. Scenes from an Italian restaurant. Oh, scenes. I mean, scenes mo- is Long Island. The song. Uh, to, to I the mean, bone. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a moving theme out. Of Long I wore out that 45. I played that thing to death. <laughs> it 
Yeah. Uh, just, <clears throat> it's so Springsteen-y. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. The sound effects, uh, the, the the reprise with the piano. Oh, come on. That's so great. Yeah, so sorry. Sorry, dude. But it, it only barely missed it, the yeah, top spot number two. on all of our lists. It almost was a yeah. tie, but... You know, yeah. I re- realized I actually didn't mention everything I wanted to mention when I was talking about Innocent Man. I do want to get these this, this, these thoughts in here. Mm. Is it, well, I... My favorite track. I have a a by far favorite track on that album, which is Leave a Tender Moment Alone. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. I love the melody. Toots Tylemans delivers a banging Stevie oh, Wonder he's, harmonica. Yes, he's great. I mean, I was listening to the track going, oh shit, I didn't know Stevie Wonder was on this record. <laughs> and I thought, well, I should, I should look up to make sure. And I thought, well, I don't have to look up because, I mean, if that isn't Stevie Wonder, the sky's in blue. And I looked it up and I was like, oh shit. <laughs> yeah. Damn, good work, Toots. If you don't know about Toots Thielman, get on it. But... I always loved that song, and I had completely forgotten about it. So when when I went through that album for this list, I was like, "Oh shit, this song!" Yeah, that's really great. But uh, yeah, and uh, keeping the faith sounds like clean up woman, but but without any balls. But anyway, all right, so there uh, we go. Oh, minus any funk or any bottom. Oh come on! <laughs> Once again, you are mistaken. Oh. Anyway, uh, all right. Anyway, so onto the commercials. <laughs> I'm Billy Joel, and New York is my home. There's no place like it in the world. My favorite place is Long Island. It's an endless beach from Long Beach to Montreux to Long Island Sound. With incredible fishing, Teddy Roosevelt's home, and the first port in the U.S. Come discover your favorite part of New York. I'm in a New York state of Plan your summer vacation at iloveny.com. There's something for everyone. Now we have sound. Hey! Hey! hey. Uh, all right. Well, everybody, thanks for watching Billy Joel, our ranking Billy Joel uh, uh, video. And all you really, really, really obsessive Billy Joel people are going to come in here to tell us how wrong we are. We are. Yeah. Um, because the number one isn't The Stranger. It's, it's some, coming. You know, alternate it's close. One that, it was is close. there like an album that's it's cooler to like? It's something. It's that well, Russian you know live some, album. Well, yeah, because some artists, you know, there's the album that's obviously the one everybody uh. puts at number one, but then you have the people who are like, oh, no, that one's overrated. Actually, it's this one. I think what it's going to be is going to be people coming at us saying, obviously, uh, Street Life Serenade is, uh, uh, is number the number one, one you no. know, or whatever. Yeah, well. Anyway, happen. all right. Well, thanks everybody for watching and thanks for subscribing if you have. But if you haven't, click the little bell and uh, maybe come back on Thursday because what way to follow up Billy Joel <sighs> ranking than to get back to our albums of the year series with 2018? So yeah, next week not... we're going to be discussing our favorite albums of 2018. No, that's not incentive. That's you've de incentivized the people. <laughs> Unincentivizing. <laughs> yeah. We have to do it, though. We're so we do. close. We we're do. So I mean, we're, we're this close. far in. And I'll say that I've gotten three private messages from people wondering when we're going to stop. Because they want us to stop? Because they want us to stop. <laughs> They're like, are you going to... Are you going to stop? Tell, Please tell me you're stopping at 2020. Please say that. No, we oh, don't, don't know yet. And we, we don't well, know Well, I, I actually, I'll say this. I, I think we're, we're going to stop at 2023. For sure. For sure. But, but, and 2024... Well, we'll see. That's that. That's that's. You don't want to do that before the year's up because who knows yeah. what's going to pop up. You know. That, yeah, because something really amazingly good could happen. Like somebody might release a good album. Well, there's allegedly a new Bruno Mars album finally coming this year. Oh, allegedly. Really? Oh. Okay. So who knows yeah, what yeah. direction he went in on this? But yeah. I'd hate to do a 2024 list and not have that on there if it's actually. Yeah, yeah. let's stop at 2020. So 2024 I, will happen. It's just not going to be as part of the series. Yeah, we'll do series, it later on. The series will end with 2023. We'll probably do a wrap up. Yeah. And I'm willing to bet that those next episodes are going to be really short, except for Paul's part. But I am short, so. <laughs> it's hey, going to be me I've listening. I've got the Davy Jones jokes. Two yeah, albums, exactly. Crystal will list yeah, four man, albums. Just because I'm short. And he'll have 47 different Paul Core releases yeah. that no one's ever heard of. <laughs> you somehow. Just you just and wait. somehow 2018 will be an hour and 40 minutes. Miss <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, 2018 is not, uh, is not one of the stronger later years for me, but I, but I do. Really? Yeah, we'll, we'll see how this goes. All right. All right. We'll see you next week. Bye. Shall we get right into it? Well, actually, you know what? Let me. Are we. Let's do we're it. Centered here. Are we are we in? Is the ceremony about to begin? <laughs> uh-huh. I mean, is that kind of basically how that's? I feel go? very centered. Yeah. Yeah, it's fine. Okay. <clears throat> I mean, yeah, I don't have my glasses on, so I can't tell. But it looks it looks now like 
uh, unusually, we're more skewed towards Crystal's side. We are. But maybe mm. we're not. We'll see. No, no, it's the same because we see half of Tommy's arm, half my of my arm. My is, is, uh, is on overdrive. The fuck out of me. But it looks not right. Yeah, it's, it's a good thing you did that. Yeah, I like how you adjusted it over slightly and then moved and then it, put back it back over slightly. Well, I put it, I put it so over. So it's in exactly the same fucking place. It just <laughs> well, right. I put it over and then I went, no, that's not right. No. So I put it back. Well, I'll tell you right now, that would have tanked the ratings. <laughs> Tank the fucking ratings. We would have lost viewers. Yeah. People would be. It's upset. like, well, it's not ratings I'm worried about. It's me <laughs> wanting to pull my hair out while I'm editing, looking at this thing being off centered. That that's move what right I, that's there. That's what I'm worried about. That move right there, Paul. <laughs> that would have been as bad as like five, six seasons into a beloved show. You add a new character. <laughs> this is this Tell is your cousin right now, Oliver. Shows that was cousin up. Oliver. Oh. Yeah. Yep. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, get ready to go. <laughs> Three, two, go ahead. Oh. A two, a one, two, three. Well, all right.